start. You're all very, very much welcome to uh, today's uh, lunch seminar with uh, Baladevan Rangayar Rangarayu. So, sorry about the pronunciation. You will have to correct me there later on. Uh, and the, 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 the topic for this seminar is school vouchers in India, which is something that Bala has worked with, and he will give a short presentation. And after his presentation, we have asked former aid min for a Minister for, for Foreign Aid, Yulina Karlsson, uh, to give her comments about this type of um, projects and uh, also explain what kind of policies uh, this, the Swedish government has conducted in this field. And after that, well, there will be enough, a lot of time for questions and answers. So, uh, and we have a very qualified public audience here today, so uh, I think we will have a very interesting in, in, uh, in discussion. And uh, so, Bala, I please come forward and, and give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Bala Devan Ranga Raju. Uh, not <laughs> you, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, you're free to call me Bala. I know it's, it's tough. It's tough even for a lot of Indians, so that's okay. Right, it's a pleasure and honor to be here in front of you. And um, at the outset, I would like to thank Frivald and Stefan and uh, uh, all uh, the others who are in his team, um, including Henrik and uh, Diana, to have uh, taken all the pains to have me over here. So um, it's really a tough topic to cover in 20 minutes. So I'm going to try my best. But if you have uh, things to ask, please um, put it in questions, and I will be happy to answer the whole evening. I'm OK, right? Because I have not been told how long I should be answering the questions. <laughs> I have only been told how long my presentation should be, right? OK. So when you say education, for most of the world, the first thing that comes to mind is um, ability to read and write or an association with uh, a more empowered set of people in the world. That's the first thing that comes to mind. For a poor person, when you say education, the first thing that comes to mind is a plate full of food. That is the key difference that we have today between most of the government policymakers and people like me and Stefan and others who are vouching for private schools. If we get this clear, I think there is, there is no room for any confusion. So whenever government policymakers create policies on laws relating to education, then they have a set of parameters. They say, we should have this big classroom or so many classrooms, and we will have ABC kind of people who will run the show. And these are the things that the school will achieve. Most of the times, these are the things the school will achieve will also be in the nature of how many classrooms and who will be the teachers, such as we will have 220 or 210 working days per year. We will have six and a half hours every day of instruction. We will start the school for the children when they are five or six, and there will be a lot of debate on this. We will spend a lot of taxpayers' money on several commissions to decide on what is the right number or the right size of the window or what should be the appropriate age at which the child should go to school. But we call this the input parameters. What the government doesn't talk about, unfortunately, including in Sweden, is the outcome of the school. Whether or not you can include 
as part of what defines a good school, the outcome, what the school does, what the school produces. If we do that, then I think defining a school becomes very easy. In India, when you say a school, as per the latest law, it means a place which is recognized by the government to run as a school. So what it means is you can have two buildings that look exactly similar, two sets of people who are exactly similarly qualified and exactly similarly passionate doing the same thing. And one could be called a school and the other could be called not a school because one has had the good fortune to know some bureaucrat or being able to bribe somebody to get a license. We call that recognition. The other has not been able to. So how easy is it to get a recognition? It is extremely difficult. Why? Because the input parameters are not practical. Who makes these parameters? People who are really, really gifted. Special category people. Because they are the top bureaucrats. They get everything they want. And they will decide for the poor people what the poor people should have. There's a huge difference here in terms of perception of what is important. So you have parameters that are impossible to meet. For example, you might have to pay teachers the same amount of salary that the government pays. Any teachers here? I have special love for them. I used to be a teacher, so, <laughs> right? Because, because they can unionize, and th their union will be holy union because they are holy people, right? You cannot link their salary with the performance. So for a small school, it becomes impossible to do this. So what will it do? It will run outside of the legal ambit. If it runs outside of the legal ambit, ideally, it should be shrinking in size because it, after all, does not have the license. But it has been growing in size. That is the story of school education in India. So what is our primary education status today? We have achieved access, but not quality. When I say access, that means for most of the children in India today, there is a school at a walkable distance. So if it's a child under 10 years of age, we think one kilometer is a walkable distance. If it's a child above 10 years of age, then we think three kilometers is a walkable distance. But in the school, when you have the access, whether there is really education happening, that's the problem. So we don't have quality. So what kind of quality do we have? Half the children in class five cannot read class two text. I'm not saying comprehend. They're two different things, right? They cannot read class two text. And this has been declining every year. It used to be 52% who were able to do it. Now it's 48% who are able to do it. But along with all of this, the number of children who are enrolled in private schools have been going up. And I'm quoting a study that calculates this in the rural areas of about 600 districts. That's almost all the districts in India. When you say rural areas, you have problems that are similar to Sweden. You don't have many schools because it doesn't make any, you know, it doesn't, there is no incentive for anybody to go and have s so many schools because the number of children is less. And the people in rural areas generally are not earning a lot, so they cannot pay a lot. Yet, the private school enrollment is going up. So how is it that when there is no incentive for schools to go set shop there, and when there is no economic power Purchase, purchasing power with the people in rural areas to pay a lot, that the schools are increasing in number. 
We have a phenomenon called the budget private schools or the affordable private schools. These are small schools. There is no incentive for a big school to go and set up shop, but there is always a good incentive for a small school to set up a shop. Three, four, three, four rooms, five teachers, you have 100 children. 100 children is very, very less in India. Okay, <laughs> So they charge about anywhere between $1 to $8 right, per month. That's US dollars. They are not great on infrastructure. They might not have a playground. They might not have laboratories. But that's also absent in public schools. Most of the public schools don't have. In Delhi, it is possible to have uh, to find a public school which does not have toilets. In fact, my current paper is comparing an unlicensed school with two public schools in a large slum in Delhi, which has about 40 to 50,000 people. And that's government school, the two government schools. One is for boys, the other is for girls. 675 girls in five classrooms with two toilets, which has not seen water since 1984. Okay. So the next thing that attracts people to these low-cost private schools is the fact that they all have English medium, mostly. I have to tell you, they don't teach Queen's English. There will be a lot of mistakes. But then, that's enough English for the children to say, hey, let's go uh, get a job as a retail salesman somewhere. Right? That's what's important for them. More importantly, the teachers are present. The teachers don't have fancy training, but they are present. On the other hand, in public schools in India, one third of the teachers don't show up. Of those who show up, one third do not engage in teaching. So it basically means nobody out there. right? And then at least the basic amenities are present. By basic amenities, I'm talking about drink water and let the water go out if need be. So if, if this is the situation, then what is the solution? Because obviously, we, we cannot wait for this phenomenon on its own to survive despite the government regulation and then say one day we will have all our children educated. We have to do something to speed up the process. People know what they want. There is another set of people who would like to give what these people want at a price that the, the clients are ready to pay and a quality that the clients are happy with. So how do we, how do we speed, it, speed it up? So that is where vouchers come in. Because we obviously recognize that there are poor people who cannot afford education. They don't have the money to buy even the $2 education. We need to then have the state come in and give a helping hand. And we also realize that at that price, it's not possible to have world-class infrastructure. But what is important is provide an avenue for those aspirational poor people who want to get out of poverty, who think education is the passport to get out of poverty, right? If we don't do that, what we will do is, in the name of equality and inclusion, we will keep the poor people poor. And that is a sin. So there are three projects that you know, has happened in India so far, three voucher projects. The first one, Pahal, is a government project. I would like to show a small uh, video of the project. Uh, where is it, Thomas? OK. OK. Dehradun mein Pahal Karakaram, June 2007 mein iski survey hui. और अगस्त 2007 से यह कार्यक्रम चल रहा है। That's a government official in charge of the project। निजी स्कूलों से जब हमने बात की तो लगभग 12 स्कूलों में हम गए। It's two to three minutes, so don't worry about the audio। केवल चार पांच स्कूल हमारे साथ काम करने के लिए तैयार हैं। बाकी लोगों ने कहा कि कूड़ा पीने वाले बच्चे, भिकारी बच्चों के साथ हमारे यहाँ और बच्चे समाजित नहीं हो पाएंगे। 
कुछ लोगों ने कठोरता से और कुछ लोगों ने विनम्रता से हम लोगों से जुड़ने से मना कर अच्छा इस कार्यक्रम को चलाने के लिए हमें क्या वित्तीय सहायता दी जाएगी The first person that you saw was a government official who is in charge of the project. This is a private school. You saw the building. This school charges about 30 euros per annum to provide education. And the government enrolled five such schools to send children who I want you to see. अर्जुन जल्दी चलो देर हो रही है ना मेरे जूते पहन लो I've been here since yesterday, and I have been talking about this phenomenon to some people, um, including the CEO of uh, Timbro here, and I used the term rack picker children, and she didn't know who they were. Rack picker children are children who literally pick rags, polythenes, papers from public areas to sell that. And take home some money. These children that you see are actually rack picker children. And the area you saw is a typical urban slum in a, in a town called Deradun, right? These children are discriminated even in free public schools because they're dirty and they are not empowered. Nobody, nobody listens to their parents. They, if there's a pencil going missing, then they'll be the first ones to be blamed, right? So to mainstream them, the government thought, okay, let's, let's try the private schools because they have an incentive if we give the money. There is no incentive for a government teacher to be kind to those children. So they started this program where th these children would go to those five private schools, and the lady that you saw was the one who would ensure the children go every day, right? So as part of the program, actually, the parents were also educated. Training program, we have teachers with them, and we have a lot of package with them. हम भूखे रहेगा क्या? बच्चे पढ़ कर जाएगा रोटी कहाँ से देंगा? जो निजी विद्यालय में अच्छे बर के बच्चे पढ़ रहे हैं, उच्च बर के बच्चे पढ़ रहे हैं, संपन्न घरों के बच्चे पढ़ रहे हैं, उनके साथ इन बच्चों को जोड़ा जा जोड़ा जा सकता है और इस तरीके से एक एक ऐसी विचारधारा का जन्म होगा बच्चों में भी इस तरीके से एक संस्कार पैदा होंगे कि हमारे समाज में कुछ ऐसे बच्चे भी हैं जो कि पिछड़ गए हैं मुख्य धारा से नहीं जुड़ पा रहे हैं तो वो लोग भी साथ में एक क्लास में बैठेंगे एक जैसी यूनिफॉर्म पहनेंगे तो एक एक सार्वभौमिकता उसमें दिखेगी
देखिए आप लोग सच बोलिए कि आज किस किस ने ब्रश किया किसने नहीं किया जिसने ब्रश नहीं किया वो खड़े हो जाओ आपको एक बात ध्यान रखनी है कि आपको ब्रश रोज करना है ठीक है मम्मी क्या करती हैं कोठी कोठी काम करती हैं पापा जी क्या करते हैं जूता पॉलिश का काम जूता पॉलिश करते हैं क्या बोलती है मम्मी मम्मी कहती है कि कबाड़ चुकने के लिए गंदी बातें नहीं जाना कबाड़ चुकने में तो मारू नहीं अच्छा तो आप फिर क्या करते हो तो नहीं चुकती हूँ और जब कबाड़ चुकती हो ना जो पैसा मिलता है उसका क्या करते हो मम्मी करते मम्मी कुछ और मम्मी क्या करते हैं this is the problem the first you saw the mother talking she was saying how would we eat if the children go to the school they need to go and work and you saw how they were brought to the school and this gentleman comes and asks what he was asking her basically was what does your mother do she said she works as a maid servant what does your father do he shines shoes and then what does your mother tell you not to pick rags what do you do i don't pick rags okay by the way when you pick rags who do you give the money to to my mom you see that's the situation that we are talking about and then if if to this family education would mean anything it would only be equipping the person to get out of poverty all other philosophical stuff i don't have time for that we know our friends talk about have no meaning here and i want you to i want you to see how these things have changed uh, for these kids this one of the voucher boys ajab uh, kawar chup So the first set of children were about 25. Two girls from those 25 went on to top the class in two years. Right? The other children who were sitting obviously were not from this kind of a background. So does it so does it really matter who was the owner of the school? Whether the taxpayers or some private family that owned the school does it matter in this case it doesn't what matters is whether or not these children have access to a school where there is an incentive for the school to take care of them and that is what low cost private schools provide so this project of the government So, was so successful that they took it to other districts until we got some people who said hey vouchers such a vulgar word how could we do that we commodified education as if there's anything in this world that is not commodified anything ever I don't I don't think there's anything that's commodified not commodified and how does it matter to that child if you asked her okay I'm going to give you a school where they will ensure that you learn and I'm going to give you another school where they're very conscious that they don't make any money out of this where do you think she wants to go to <coughs> that is very important but the government because of political pressures first changed the name from voucher program to pahel which is first step that's what the name is now then they called it scholarship and then we have the new law after this a federal law this was a state project federal law that says 25% of all private schools 25% seats should be reserved for children of lower income groups and the government would compensate for it but like all huge projects of the government it's riddled with problems design issues corruption no payment to the schools on time so it is not taken off well but for this government they had to end this and merge it with that larger project which really didn't take off but we did a couple of projects ourselves 
And one was the daily voucher project, and the next was school voucher for girls. I would quickly just mention one important point about school voucher for girls, and I think that's, that's got something, some relevance to Sweden too, because I was talking to um, uh, the CEO of um, uh, Timbro, and I was also reading her paper, and I thought there's a huge relevance. And that is the problem with private schools, according to some people, okay, you don't like my choice of the slide. <laughs> okay. So the problem is that the private schools exploit poor people. They do not know which ones to go to, which ones are good. And, and, and the solution they suggest is shut down these schools, make it all public. So I say, if you think the problem is poor people do not know how to choose, then solve that problem. So one way of doing it is providing information. There's an information asymmetry. You think educated people, well-to-do people know some things that poor people do not know, then fill that information gap. And you would see how these people do well. That's what we did in School Voucher for Girls. We gave vouchers to 400 girl children so that they could go to private schools of their choice we enrolled about 55 schools. And, and these were children from really poor background, parents mostly illiterate. But what we did was come up with a booklet called the Parents Handbook, and we put for all of those 55 schools what, what was on offer, the infrastructure, quality, whatever. And what did we see? These people who do not know how to read and write take this to their employers, friends, relatives and get them color-coded. Come back and say, I want to try in all the yellow schools. And I don't want anything to do with the red schools. It's too far, and I have a daughter. I don't want her to go up, for example. right? And then about 30 of them got together and went and bargained with the best school in the area for more benefits, because they were 30 in number now together. We are talking about illiterate people who are intimidated by the word private. They've never been to school, but the moment you empower them with a voucher and information, they know how to get the best deal for themselves. And I think if any government wants to do, wa wants, to, wants to achieve universal quality education for the children, they should empower the people with purchase power and information. The rest, the people will do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bala and uh, Yunila, please join us. Thank you so much. And uh, Bala, it's great to have you here and to uh, Stefan and Free World. Already one year ago, you published a report by Pauline Dixon about this area. And to all of you who have come here today, recall where you first heard these talks. Because if we care about poverty, if we see that today the world is having actually increasing inequalities, but the way to come out of poverty is for many, of course, to migrate and other things, where Timbro and Free World also has been talking about that, but education is key if we would like to see that both individuals and thereby societies can grow. And that's why this event is so interesting, because now we are in the midst of assessing the current MDGs. And we can see that now more and more kids in the world are enrolled to schools. But Africa and Asia are increasingly seeing that the quality of that education over decades has been too poor. So people are still caught or trapped in poverty. And here is some kind of solution. And I, why I wanted to come to make an intervention today and to thank you for this is that this is happening now anyhow. The poorest people of the world really wants to do something for and by themselves. And they are used already to pay the most for the worst services. So when things like this happens on the market, there is a huge potential, not only for the individuals, but also for, for uh, markets to solve a problem. 
And markets can be very good on this, but because they can also be context specific. That's also something we have learned. The big scale projects that works perhaps in parts of Sweden doesn't work perhaps in India. <laughs> and that's why I tried so much to move out from what we in our aid have kallat utbetalning smålet. I don't know the English, you know, but we had a goal here that we were supposed to give out a lot of money. That was the only thing that was measured. I but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can load it. No, I can no longer load it for you. So what we try to do is really to change that to go into impact and thereby start to managing for results. But also to see that on markets we can find out much better analysis about what works because there are some, it's so important that you also see the environment that we hear so. Why are girls not attending school? What can we do? So if you have the right incentives, you can really use the power of the markets but also new entrepreneurs also in other areas, but education, I think, is very, very good to show about. And that's why I would like, for the further conversation, because what has this to do with aid? Uh, because that Sweden and the European states still think neoclassical, neocolonialism. We think that we can move countries out of poverty. That's why we have general budget support. You probably heard about it, that we tried, you know, to help a government to become and behave better, but it doesn't work. And that's why we have now, in the years to come, as, as from free world and from, from other parts of the society, to start to think about, so what do we do about that people now are still living in poverty without having been empowered, without education and good health enough? I think we should link to the debate that is now going on in the world about social security schemes. Because we really have a role to play here. If we would like now to realize what the world looks like, we have poor people in almost every country. And if we, that believes in mankind and in markets, we should really see individuals instead of big states. And that's why we should take on that discussion on social security schemes, but to ask them to be targeted much better. And of course to work with the markets, because there is a debate going on, and I don't see enough voices for that. The Swedish church is doing that beautifully, and that is really to target the most vulnerable people. And here we can use the lessons learned by you, Pauline, and others, to really say that this might be a way where aid can provide some better results. It's at least worth trying, because business, as usual, will not be sustainable. I can go on, yeah. but I think it's better if we have a discussion and to hear more from Bala. But thank you so much for coming and enlightening us, and thank you so thank much, you. Stefan, for organizing. Yes, please thank you so uh, much. join yeah. us. And we are, I'll start out with a couple of questions, and then we will move on to a few in, in the audience. But let me start with you, Gunilla, that, that uh, um, my, my colleague here, Diana, told me that the, the amount of money that the, that the Swedish government in through, the, through aid money that we spend on education is not so much, actually. It's, it's like uh, less than uh, 700 million Swedish kronor. Yes, because I felt, and to be very, it's about te te technology now, but when I was Minister for Development Corporation, I thought that Sweden should try to realize where do we have comparative advantages. And where can I find friends and partners that could help me to work? And literally, I'm saying me, because I felt rather alone. Who can help me to start to understand the power of innovation, where we can have more understanding and also to build partnerships around some issues? And it was actually easier from a Swedish perspective to choose help, because there oh we right. could work with Gates Foundation, mm -hmm. there we could work on Gavi and others that we can have this kind of thinking inserted into Swedish bilateral aid. That doesn't mean that we have given up, but unfortunately, you know, you can't be good in everything. And that's why we said we continue, but I think to go on health was the <coughs> easiest way to, to crack some nuts. You see All what right. I mean? <laughs> because if just sending more money into UNICEF wouldn't make any sense at all. I'm sorry to say. But I stand for that, because that's we think we support education by giving loads of money to UNICEF. We are only supporting the bureaucracy of the UN, because we are not organized in this, in the Swedish aid. And that's why also I want CEDA, you know, to do much more research, innovations, finding new ways of targeting individuals. And then the big multi-things that we also put money to, they can go on for a while. But that's why we couldn't do everything. And uh, right. we have just started that journey, I think, in Sweden, trying to prioritize and trying also to be the most courageous donors to finding out what's 
changing the world. Okay. And how can we work with the changing world? Because <laughs> the world will change despite it. May I, I have a follow-up question then about the UNICEF? Because I, th I think it, it's their policy that, that every child should have uh, uh, educa basic education for free. Isn't yes, that the because there is a l huge debate about universal access, and that means that they think that states... I'm, I'm generalizing now, because there's a lot of smart people in UNICEF. But recall that over, I mean, we have been doing aid for 50 years, but at last the last 10 years, we have known that the education systems in many states are flawed, doesn't work, teachers don't show up, the toilets are dirty, and so on and so forth. And they have continued to pay out money, you see. So UNICEF also is responsible for not responding in good times to new innovations. Uh, so I think we'd we, we should, of course, continue to do education support in Sweden, but we should also link that to performance. And also, again, with social security schemes. I think here, Free World and Timbro and others, because this is part of a social security scheme thinking, targeting individuals instead and using incentives. And thereby, we can start to tear up all the frontiers that are actually still in, in the aid industry of Sweden. Was that an answer to your question? M maybe it was. I don't know. I, don't know. I, I, <laughs> I, would, I would like to <laughs> add, add something here. Yes. What is Please. free? There's nothing that's free. Somebody else is paying for it. So what you're basically saying when you're saying free education is we will take from some and give it to others. That's all. So that, that, that word free itself sends a very wrong connotation. Somehow, meaning when you say free, it is less burdensome. But it is hugely burdensome, exactly. especially because when you take from one to give to another, there is a cost for the transfer. As, as Gunilla put it, the bureaucracy. So you have to have a system that transfers this money, and that system is generally very leaky. So the, it's, it's, it's much easier if we actually put a cost to it and say, well, this education will be funded by the taxpayer. Then people know, okay, I'm paying so much for this. Mm. And because of that word free, it's mainly very good for politicians, <laughs> yeah. but for people. I mean, because you... I, I didn't <laughs> want to mention that <laughs> standing next to you. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is that um, it's also about lack of accountability, because yeah. no one is scrutinizing the thing, and it sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, my position, I think we should really see that we can target vulnerable groups and helping people living in poverty to come out of that. And education is one of the ways. That's right, that's right. Okay. So that's why we have to not s end up thinking that we should make interventions, but they need to be much smarter. Bala, may I ask yeah. you a question? Because I think uh, that some, some of you might not understand it, but when the, the, uh, the, the, um, the public schools, yeah. the uh, attending a public school, it isn't really free in, 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 in the Swedish sense that you get you get your books for free, mm -hmm. and you get your tuition for free, and you get your food for free, and we don't have school uniforms, but we if we had, they would probably be free. Okay. But if you attend a public school in India, you will have to pay for some of this. Or Actually, no. Um, most of the public schools are free. There are different kinds of public schools that, that probably you know, ex it would explain more the incentive for keeping the public schools uh, for the bureaucracy. We have one set of public schools that cater to the children of the bureaucrats. It's called the Kendri Vidyalias, and they are, they are as good as any elite private school because they are run with a different set of rules. For example, the teachers can be fired right, by the principal if they didn't show up. And so um, that's one set. And then among the you know, rest of the public schools, there are schools which have probably a $1 fee, but most public schools are absolutely free. And you get lunch, you get um, uh, uniforms, you get uh, uh, stationery, and textbook, everything. Yes. In most of 99% is free, except those Kendri Vidyalias. But the, but the teachers don't show up. Well, <laughs> uh, that's, that's precisely the problem, because we somehow do not want to consider teachers as employees. We put so much of cultural premium on teachers, and they hold such huge influence on policies because of their united power you know, as unions that 
we don't consider or we, we don't measure their work like you would do in any other case. So we should be able to say, hey, you didn't do well, so you're not getting promoted. He did well, he's getting promoted. At least in India, that's not happening. We cannot associate the performance of <coughs> children with the performance of government school teachers. So there is no incentive for the teachers to do well. You just don't have to show up, no problem. You still will get promoted according to your seniority and you will get uh, some government committee will sit together and say there has been inflation. Poor teachers who find it very hard not to show up need more money, <laughs> so give them more money. And I think isn't that the, the key here? Universal access uh, and no fee, but it's not enough. You also have to measure the, the results, yeah. the outcome. And how do you do that? And that's why you have to work both with markets and politics. You see what I mean? Yeah. It's so easy to just do the first step to say that, and then we are, f we are ready. Yeah, we are ready. We have so done it's, our it's more to see the performance. And we, I think this is also what it looks like in Sweden. And yeah. the risk is that we now we see increased uh, dispari uh, disparity. disparity in our societies because we don't tackle why aren't teachers showing up? Why do they, you know, Where they not? So, so the where the children not achieving yeah. at all. So okay. the, the, the trend could be also here in Sweden. Because okay. we have dropouts from school and we don't ask why. Yes. Do we put enough resources? Do we measure the outcome? All right. And that's yeah. sometimes linked to poverty. But yeah. everything is relative here. Yeah. But we should talk about India. So yeah. uh, I have a final question. Uh, that's for you, for to, to you, Gunilla. Now, uh, assuming that you're a, a, a politician here and, and, and discover that, well, this is something that I, I would like to see Sweden do. Uh, this, is something I, this is something I would, I want my taxpayer, tax money go to. If, <coughs> if now you're not the, the Minister of Foreign Aid anymore, but uh, but you, uh, I, uh, since you were foreign minister for it, you know how the system works. So, if we were would like to introduce this in, in, into the Swedish thinking, how should we do? No, I think it's. But you know, sometimes to give space for something new, you have to take away something bad. Oh, oh no, not not bad, but old. Old, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that uh, general budget support was bad because you had the wrong image. But it was, you know, so. I really tried here to give space for this kind mm. of new thinking, and that's why I mentioned to you the whole debate on social security schemes. I think there one should go. One should also see now, for example, Sweden, Sweden is not engaged in India, but we yeah. are with multilateral aid. So what is our response? How can we see to... Because a lot of these I initiatives are driven by so-called... Not Entrep poor, but entrepreneurs yeah. that really see a market here. Yeah. And I think CEDA is actually one of those aid organizations now that are trying to turn these things around. So we should consti constantly na knock on that door. But when I was a minister, it was really hard as it was not really up and running. And it was considered that aid is classically working with different modalities. And it's really hard to go into country-specific in-regions situations. And that's why I think if we still start to say that we should target individuals in the aid system, then they will work it out, because in some parts it's bad education, other parts it's bad health, or low water quality, or well whatever. It's so context specific, <laughs> and we can't know about that sitting here in Sweden. And that's why I think we should try to change everything around when it comes to aid and move out of these big institutions. All right. Hopefully before uh, the end of ending world poverty. <laughs> you know, I because we only have, most of the countries now have come out of poverty, thanks to markets. <coughs> But where aid are, aid should be much more seeing the individuals and realizing the context specifics. And, and there we really have a role to play and perhaps we should have this other s seminar about yes. the <laughs> implementation of this thinking instead. Yes, because it's a tricky question and yes. um, it will not come by, by accident. Yes. And now with some questions from the audience and we have uh, Anders Schultien. Uh, Wait for the... And, and state your name. Uh, uh, I'm a, a school operator, uh, actually. And you and I visited a few of the your voucher schools yes. outside Delhi a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, and you spoke now about recognition and yeah. you know, made a clear statement that there are schools and there are no uh, yeah. other buildings uh, where education is going on that yeah. they are not recognized as schools. Yeah. 
having read uh, James Tooley and talked a lot uh, to him, there are also a growing number of unrecognized private schools uh, in not in the slum, but in the outskirts of the slum, where mm. you cannot find any state schools provision at all. Mm. Uh, it would be quite interesting to, to hear more about that, and, and if that is continuing to happen in, in India. And, and I also must say that you should have been here three or four months ago when we had uh, our election campaign, because there were actually a lack of politicians uh, talking about exactly the sort of argument you are raising here about creating the right incentives in order to get the results there. Uh, and, and if we can export something from Sweden to India, it is actually the voucher idea and the idea that incentives really matters for the outcomes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anders, for those kind words. Um, we would like to import the voucher idea from Sweden without the socialist baggage that comes with it, <laughs> right? <laughs> there, are, there are some parts of your scheme that are not really good, for example, um, to have the municipality decide who should open a school. What that means is once I open a school, I don't have any incentive to keep doing well because the government will protect my business by making sure there's no competition, right? So that aside, yes, uh, the unrecognized schools are, are, are uh, expanding and growing in numbers, uh, not necessarily just in slums, that's why I said in rural areas. So rural areas are generally not slums, they're villages, right? And even there they are uh, uh, um, growing in number. What is unfortunate is the Right to Education Act, which came uh, into, into uh, uh, operation in uh, 2010, uh, it makes running of the unrecognized school a criminal offense, right? For which you can even be jailed. And so there have been uh, uh, schools that have been ordered shot. Uh, on our website, we maintain a counter called the Daily Wrong, uh, showing how many schools have been ordered shut, how many have been shut, and approximately how many children are being affected. Uh, so far, about 1.3 million as per our calculation. But these schools, when they shut, they only shut down on paper. Because where are the 1.3 million children then? They're still going to the schools. And the government has not provided any alternate mechanism. So let us say there is one unrecognized school which has 500 children and it runs from class one to eight. And it's an English medium. And now on paper it is shut. So those 500 children have to go to some other school if it's an unrecognized school, then it was charging very less. The, children, the, the parents cannot afford recognized school. So they have to shift them to state schools. State schools are not English medium. So the child is going to have a huge difficulty. So obviously they have not shifted. That is a great opportunity for the <laughs> school inspector to build his new house and buy his new car, right? So schools run because there is corruption. Corruption is our solution. All right. <laughs> <coughs> uh, we have a question here. Please. Yes, my name is uh, Klaus Örjan Spong. I have worked as a high school teacher for 20 years and also I worked at the latest uh, school reform okay. project okay. of the, the Swedish school system. Nice to and uh, I, I want to ask you about the quality deterioration problem. Yeah. Because we have noticed this quite uh, to some very great extent uh, yeah. in the Swedish school system. Yeah. The output that you mentioned is getting yeah. Yeah. worse and the results are getting worse. Yeah. And we uh, have noticed a number of explanations for this. Yeah. Uh, for instance, yeah, we have the, the cost of school books in Sweden is about half of it what it is in comparable countries such, such as Norway and Denmark. The classrooms are not equipped uh, like this room is with a projector, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in other ways, and uh, most of them are quite obsolete. Mm -hmm. We have uh, uh, the w one of the lowest salaries of teacher salaries in Western Europe, mm -hmm. and this does not uh, encourage teachers, ex especially good teachers, to stay on the job. Mm -hmm. And we also have. Uh, one of the lowest uh, teacher education mm. 
costs of uh, Western Europe. Yeah. Uh, not, not to mention uh, other problems. But uh, uh, the, the this is uh, due to, to cost cutting uh, from the uh, school voucher incomes. Uh, I mean, the budget is this. You, you get the, the school, all schools without exception get, get incomes from school vouchers. Yeah. They cost cut in uh, ways that are not good for the, for the pupils, definitely not. And uh, there's no uh, really effective control of uh, mm -hmm. uh, the output of the schools, what kind of quality of education they uh, give the, the children. Uh, how, how, how have you dealt with this problem in India? This, this is what I want to know. Okay. Um, we haven't dealt with the problem yet. That's why we have poor quality. Um, the reason for that is I think um, most of what you said is what the governments also believe, that if you put more money, then you'll have better quality. If you put more money in teacher education, then we'll have better teachers. If you pay the teachers more, then we'll have better teachers. If you have better classrooms, then there'll be better output. I would tend to disagree with that because while all of these are definitely contributing factors, there has not been a single study that shows a causal relationship. Unfortunate for Sweden is after showing the world w what the direction should be, now most of the debate is around maybe the PISA rankings are going down because of the vouchers. That is very, for lack of any other word, funny <laughs> because so you had a system before the 1990s where the, the quality was poor. You introduce a treatment, and then you start becoming healthy. So that's clear sign that the treatment is working. Now you're again health is deteriorating. You're saying the treatment is not working. Hey, the treatment was working was already proven. We need to look at other tests, what's happened. So I think for all governments, for all of us, what is important is not to simply push the cost to already established parameters and say, hey, my, my job is done. So, you know, I have, I have said uh, less money, therefore it's, it's okay. That, and two is what is good quality? Who decides that? I would imagine a lot of people here who are old enough to have grown up children would say, I give a lot of lessons to my child. Did they have projectors in their houses? I don't think so. We don't have projectors in, their, in our houses. But they are able to give great lessons to the children. So it's quite possible that we have to come up with incentives for the people. You as a dad had a great incentive to ensure your child learned some lessons. So we need to find that. And two, we need to find a better way of understanding what is quality. So one of the debates in Sweden I see is great inflation. But if you are going to ask me to do something and ask me to rate myself, and then you expect me to be honest, I'm sorry, I'm not going to the crucifix. No. So how can we solve that? One example I could say is, you know, if today if you have a child and you think this child is not well, you take him to a pathologist and say, hey, my child is a boy and he's 12 years old. I think he's not well. He runs a test and tells you, your child is okay. Don't worry. Is it possible to do that for education? Can you just take and say, please run a test. I'm not going to tell you which school he's from. This is the grade he is in. Can you tell me whether or not he knows 50% of what he should know? We don't have that. I think we need to find ways to better understand what is quality. We should not let few experts, however intelligent and noble they are, to decide what is right and what is good quality for everybody else. And we should have to reduce the subjective element in grading and increase opportunities for objective grading to, to, to diagnose and say this is, this is where the quality is. If you do that and ensure there is competition, it, look, look at technology, how it is working. Today, if I have to call up anybody in the world, I don't think twice. I can tell you, you will think twice. 
because in India we have one of the cheapest telephone in the world. All my friends I call up from my phone and then I still end up paying probably hundred dollars per month. It was not the case when the state had monopoly or when it decided who would come in. A man who does not have food, a homeless man today in the Delhi streets has a mobile phone. There's a lesson for all of us to learn from there. Okay, then we have uh, questions for Aaron and then John. Uh, thank you very much, very interesting. Uh, my name is Aaron Koreva, I work for the Moderate Party. Okay. Uh, my mother is a teacher, so I guess that's why I'm, I'm interested in this. Um, <laughs> short question, I guess, uh, apart from a lot of um, bad things that were said uh, in the Swedish election about the um, voucher system, was also the fact that, well, private schools, they uh, make a lot of profits. This is goes back to the money issue, right? If we have more money, then everything's yeah. going to be fine, and these private schools take away too much money yeah. from the voucher system and so on. I just wonder, I is there any limit in India in terms of uh, how much money you can make of a private school or how much money you have to invest back and this and that? Okay. It's just to see if we can learn a lesson okay. from this. Technically, in India, you cannot make money on education because if you want to run an education institution, it has to be a not-for-profit enterprise, technically. But <laughs> <laughs> I think the, 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 the people who claim to be most selfless are the politicians, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Do they make money or not? Do they make money? Yes. Well, then how can they expect anybody else not to? Especially when you have to buy your land, you have to build your building, you have to run a business where the cost, the price, and the number of customers are controlled by the government. And then you expect that person to take nothing out of it. It's just being, you know, stupid. All right. <coughs> Hello, Bala. My name is Johan Funason. I used to work in India with these kind of school vouchers. Um, my question to Bala is, what is the attitude from the NGOs, especially the, well, both the Indian and the international NGOs towards school vouchers? That's a short question. Okay. Well, in, in NGOs are, I, I personally think, the private property of governments, right? So the government wants to have a different ki you know, kind of property. So we have a word in Hindi called binami, which basically means, I want, and I'm a politician, I want to have property, but I can't buy on my name. So I put it in my sister's name, brother's name, right? It's my property. So NGOs are the binami property of the government. They run on government money. They will never say anything that the government will not like. Uh, Ganila was very kind to, to uh, uh, say the same thing about UNICEF, which is the largest NGO in the world. So NGOs will just simply follow what the government wants to do because they get their project money from there, right? So they have really no stated position on anything. They go with the flow. Right. Do we have a, um, you want to say something? Yeah, no, I, I think more. there are a lot of good NGOs. There are people in civil society that are trying now to figure out what can be better. For example, on aid, about how we organize our societies and trying to figure out what's missing. And for us, I think taking your debate back from India to Sweden, it's really interesting to see because the, the questions are more and more the same. So how do we ensure good Good quality, quality in education, how do we see that we use market incentives in a good way? How do we evaluate and how do we see that the, the, the poorest person is really the best beneficiary mm. for our mm. joint endeavors? Mm. And, and this is a very tricky thing in, in all societies. Yeah. Uh, and we think that education is really the key thing to make mm. people move out of poverty. Mm. So I think it's so much similarities these days. Yeah. And we have to be humble because it's very hard with development. But still it's happening. <laughs> And many places it's happening thanks to entrepreneurs, and that's what I thought was so good, you coming here from India, because we see now that so-called poor people are taking a lot in their own hands. Like we heard about slum dwellers yeah. starting their own schools. It's fantastic to see 
the opportunities today, sometimes also thanks to, to, to mobile phones, yeah. <laughs> that they can have access to better quality. Yeah. So I think this is happening anyhow. But the question is, how can we work with that flow and not to work against it? And that's why I was happy to come here and to make interventions, because sometimes the aid bureaucracy is still back in old style schools and don't really realize how things are rapidly changing. And it's driven by the so-called poorest people. Sure. Uh, and they, I am always saying people are not poor. They, f they are so full of incentives. They are so uh, aspirational. Aspiration, yeah. But they, they are living in situations of poverty and they want to move out of that. And that we have to recognize. And that's why I think this debate will really help us also to how we see our own school systems here in Sweden and to, to protect our voter system. Yeah. Uh, but of course also to see how we can go with the flow and try to help also our aid to be more relevant and to encourage these kind of still Initiative. new thinking, yeah. new thinking. Yeah. Or okay. the record, I run an NGO. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with yeah. that, with that uh, remarkable speech in favor of market economy and <laughs> how to raise people from poverty, we will end this session. And I am uh, say thank you for to Bala and Gunilla that you came. Thank you so much, Stefan, for this opportunity. Uh, very much. And thank you, Gunilla. Pleasure. Pleasure. And, um, and, and, a, and, a and a final word before we, we all leave. Uh, it, you have written about this also, yeah. your project. So there are, you can find publications on the India Institute website. And we also have a, a, a report written by Pauline Dixon, who is a, r a researcher in this field. And you can find it on the Free World website. So thank you for coming. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much.